D. Eve my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. In his 1904 play The King's Threshold, William Butler Yeats had one of his characters undergo Trusca, the process of fasting to seek legal redress as outlined in the 8th century Brehan law tract, the Shenicus Moor. Where a powerful individual had committed an offence against someone of inferior rank and refused to compensate them, the victim could begin a fast on the doorstep of the culprit highlighting the injustice and damaging their reputation within the community. While the Gaelic revival saw a surge in the study of medieval Irish history, those who adopted the hunger strike in Ireland in the early part of the 20th century knew little of its links to the ancient past. Inspired by Russian prisoners who had undergone hunger strikes to protest against the conditions they were kept in, the suffragette movement in Britain and Ireland used what became known as the Russian method to demand political prisoner status when arrested. In 1912, at the same time that Hannah E. Skeffington was undergoing a hunger strike in Mount Joy, imprisoned Hindu revolutionaries were doing the same in India. In May of 1917, Commandants Eamon de Valera, Tomás Ash and Tom Hunter led a hunger strike to pressure the British government into releasing the last of those still in prison following the Easter Rising. Released in June, Ash was rearrested in September and along with 37 other prisoners began a hunger strike to demand political prisoner status. The authorities responded by force feeding the men, which resulted in Ash dying on the 25th of September. The prisoners' demands were immediately granted and the publicity generated by Ash's funeral saw the government resort to what was known as the Cat and Mouse Act, whereby prisoners on hunger strike would be released to recuperate and then rearrested when they had recovered. The accidental release of hundreds of prisoners nationwide following a hunger strike in Mount Joy in April of 1920 led to the British hardening their stance. The RIC were demoralised as they saw men arrested on suspicion of killing their comrades, released after a short hunger strike and then going on the run. There were calls to let hunger strikers starve and a belief that they would break in the face of British determination. IRA General Headquarters therefore declared that while no one was under an obligation to go on hunger strike, anyone that did must be prepared to carry it through to the end and could not come off of it unless ordered by General Headquarters. On the 11th of August, a number of prisoners at Cork Jail went on hunger strike, when informed that evening the officer commanding the Cork No. 1 Brigade, Terence McSweeney, responded, If that is the case, they'll have to stick it out. Following the killing of Thomas McCurtain by members of the RIC in March, McSweeney had succeeded him as both Brigade OC and Lord Mayor of Cork. On the 12th of August, as a meeting of Cork Brigade officers was about to begin at City Hall, soldiers from Victoria Barracks, assisted by six armoured cars, surrounded the building. Though they attempted to escape, the men were easily rounded up and taken to a shed at the back of the building while a search was carried out. When McSweeney arrived, he was asked what they should do, to which he responded simply, Hunger strike. From that moment on, he refused food. One of the IRA officers attempted to tear up an RIC cipher he had in his possession, but this was later found by a British soldier. By claiming that McSweeney had been found destroying the cipher, the British authorities felt confident that they had enough to prosecute him. Delighted to have scored such a major victory, the other men who had been arrested with him were released on the 15th of August. Having failed to identify them, the British didn't know that they had just released the most important officers in the most active part of the country, including Sean O'Hegarty, who would replace McSweeney as No. 1 Brigade's officer commanding, and Liam Lynch, the commander of No. 2 Brigade. Under the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, McSweeney was tried by a district court-martial on the 16th of August, charged with illegal possession of an RIC cipher and possession of seditious documents found in his desk, namely a resolution passed by Cork Corporation swearing allegiance to Dáil Éireann. His guilt or innocence would be decided by three British Army officers, President of the Court Martial, Lieutenant Colonel James of the South Staffordshire Regiment, Captain Reeves of the Hampshire Regiment, and Major A. E. Percival of the Essex Regiment. When addressed by the court, McSweeney declared, I am the Lord Mayor of Cork and Chief Magistrate of this city, and I declare this court illegal, and that those who take part in it are liable to arrest under the laws of the Irish Republic. 
When claims were made that he was found in possession of an RIC cipher, he rejected this, but informed the court that as Lord Mayor he was entitled to have the code, and that he had delegated its possession, as was his right, to another person. Following the prosecution's case, the military officers took just 15 minutes to come to a verdict. McSweeney was found not guilty on the charge of illegal possession of the cipher, indicating that the court was reluctantly forced to recognise his authority, but he was found guilty of possessing seditious documents. Before sentence was passed, McSweeney informed the court, I will put a limit to any term of imprisonment you may impose. I have taken no food since Thursday, therefore I will be free in a month. The president of the court asked if he meant that he would continue his hunger strike, to which McSweeney responded, I shall be free, alive or dead, within a month. He was sentenced to two years' imprisonment. At four o'clock in the morning of the 17th of August, McSweeney was taken from Cork to Wales on board a naval vessel and then by train to London, arriving at Brixton Prison 24 hours later. Already in a weakened state after five days without food, the prison doctor advised the authorities that he would not survive force feeding. McSweeney had undertaken his hunger strike in the firm belief that he would be released within days, but the British government was just as firmly convinced that McSweeney and the other hunger strikers in Cork would give up. With little existing empirical knowledge, it was believed at the time that no one could survive more than three weeks without food, and it could be expected that the deaths of the first few strikers would break the morale of the others. As this benchmark came and went, however, worldwide media attention started to focus on McSweeney in particular. A theological debate on the morality of the hunger strike broke out in religious journals throughout the world, which the British government tried to use to their advantage. In September, the Prime Minister David Lloyd George met with English Cardinal Aidan Gasquet and asked him to put pressure on the Pope to denounce the hunger strike as an act of suicide. Wary of the damage that had been caused by the condemnation of the plan of campaign in 1888 and the attitudes of some of the most influential members of the church in America, Pope Benedict XV had been cautious about making any statement on the War of Independence. A panel of experts on moral theology were charged with giving their opinion on the matter, and while the general consensus was that McSweeney's hunger strike was not an act of suicide, they also advised that it would be best not to respond to the British Prime Minister. During most of his imprisonment, McSweeney was allowed to have visitors whenever he wanted. As his condition deteriorated, his family took it in turns to make sure someone was with him 24-7 in case an attempt was made to force feed him. They also kept the media informed, and his position as Lord Mayor of a major city within the British Empire attracted sensational worldwide coverage in a way that the 11 prisoners in Cork Jail could not. McSweeney had briefly spoken with them while awaiting his court-martial. In Brixton he inquired daily about how they were doing, and on the 40th day of their hunger strike he dictated a press release, congratulating them on emulating the fast undertaken by Jesus Christ in the desert. McSweeney was deeply religious, and reports of his dedication to his faith helped to build him as a martyr in the eyes of the watching public. He had his family read aloud passages from his heavily annotated copy of The Imitation of Christ, and he spoke constantly of Joan of Arc, who had been canonized only a few months beforehand, saying, Our fight is her fight over again, against the same enemy and for the same cause. As the hunger strike continued into October, interest grew to a fever pitch. In Parisian theatres, updates on the Lord Mayor's condition were given in between acts. Numerous appeals were sent from South America asking the Pope to intervene, and the Irish Patriotic Strike by longshoremen in New York caused havoc for British shipping. By now McSweeney was in severe ill health. He had difficulty breathing and had grown so physically weak that the weight of his bedclothes caused him tremendous pain. On the 17th of October, after 67 days without food, Michael Fitzgerald died in Cork. McSweeney had held out hope that he and the other prisoners would be released, but when told of Fitzgerald's death, he realised that this would not happen. The following day, he dictated a final message to Cork Corporation and began to prepare for his own death. 
On the 20th of October, world attention was kept focused on Ireland as 18-year-old IRA volunteer Kevin Barry was tried by court-martial. A medical student at University College Dublin, Barry had taken part in an ambush on a British lorry as it collected bread a month earlier. While the intention had been to hold up the lorry and seize the weapons carried by the soldiers, a firefight broke out during which Barry's gun jammed. He tried to hide under the vehicle but was captured after the volunteers were forced to retreat. Three British soldiers, aged between 19 and 20, were killed during the ambush and at his court-martial Barry was charged with one of their murders. After a short trial, he was sentenced to death by hanging. By now, McSweeney was falling in and out of consciousness and suffering bouts of delirium. A doctor sent by the Home Office to report on his condition blocked his family from seeing him, and only his brother Sean and his confessor, Father Dominic, were with him when he died early in the morning of the 25th of October, on his 74th day of hunger strike. Just a few hours later, Joseph Murphy died in Cork, having gone 76 days without food. The news of McSweeney's death was met with grief and anger across the world. In Barcelona, protesters shattered the windows of the British consulate and up to 50,000 mourners took part in a mock funeral in Chicago, one of a number held throughout Australia, the United States and Britain. Following Requiem Mass at Southwark Cathedral on the 28th of October, a procession of over 10,000 people marched to Euston Station, led by Archbishop Dr Mannix of Melbourne, representatives of Dáil Éireann, Cork Corporation, the Trades Union Congress and the mayors of several British cities. The intention was for McSweeney's body to be taken to Dublin where it would lie in state, but at Hollyhead the coffin was seized by Black and Tans under orders from the Home Office and put on board a special government boat for direct transport to Cork. Plans for a day of mourning in Dublin went ahead even without McSweeney's body and a requiem mass at the Pro Cathedral was led by the elderly Archbishop William Walsh. One of those who assisted him, Father Augustine Hayden, had rushed the church after visiting Kevin Barry at Mount Joy. The date of his execution had just been set for the 1st of November. A statement outlining the torture he had suffered after his arrest had been smuggled out of the jail and was published in Dole Aaron's press sheet, the Irish Bulletin, where it was picked up by media sources around the world. With tensions running high, numerous calls were made to commute his sentence due to his age, including from King George V, but these were rejected by the government. At the same time, McSweeney's coffin was arriving at Cove. 120 members of the Cork No. 1 Brigade escorted it to City Hall, where it lay in state the following day. On the 31st of October, after funeral mass at Cork Cathedral, up to 100,000 people lined the streets as McSweeney was taken to the Republican plot at St. Finbar Cemetery, where he was buried besides his friend, Thomas McCurtain. At 8 o'clock the next morning, Kevin Barry was hanged in Mount Joy, and the day after, James Daly was executed by firing squad in India for his role in the Connacht Mutiny. Following his election to succeed Thomas McCurtain as Lord Mayor of Cork, Terence McSweeney addressed the corporation and declared, It is not they who can inflict the most, but they who can suffer the most who will conquer. His words and actions would go on to influence the course of insurgent warfare over the next century. Ho Chi Minh, who had made contact with Irish separatists while living in London, was deeply moved by McSweeney's martyrdom and declared that, a nation which has such citizens will never surrender. A Hindu nationalist who died on hunger strike in 1929 was called the Indian Terence McSweeney and he served as an inspiration to Algerian nationalists during their war of independence against France. While the hunger strikers had drawn worldwide attention to the Irish Revolution, British authorities showed no intention of releasing the remaining prisoners and in early November they were ordered to come off the strike by Arthur Griffith. The tactic was banned by IRA GHQ for the duration of the War of Independence but was renewed by anti-treaty prisoners during the Civil War and by the IRA on both sides of the border afterwards. The deaths of McSweeney and Barry generated considerable outrage in Britain itself and began the process of bringing the government to the negotiating table but they were also a considerable loss to the Republican movement, already reeling from the arrival of the auxiliaries and the new intelligence structure operating out of Dublin Castle. 
As a show of force, Michael Collins ordered a nationwide wave of violence to coincide with Kevin Barry's execution, and while cooler heads eventually prevailed on him to rescind the order, no one told County Kerry. In the next episode, I'll cover the Siege of Tralee and the most famous battle of the War of Independence. A battle that never happened. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of all.